may be seated. Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, to that portion of Scripture that we read just a few moments ago. And uh, as you're turning, uh, I'd like to make one other announcement, which is actually also a prayer request. <clears throat> Some of you know that my daughter and son-in-law, Daniel and Anastasia, are in the process of adopting two little boys from Ukraine. This is a very long story, but I'm going to make it very short. In the process, since they adopted the two little boys from China two years ago, there is a new regulation that has gone into effect requiring criminal background checks of all adoptive parents of international children uh, from age 18 up to the current time. My son-in-law, Daniel, is the son of missionaries to Papua New Guinea. And um, he stayed in New Guinea from age 18 to 19, waiting for his younger sister, who ended up becoming my daughter's best friend, and hence my daughter met Daniel. Um, but, they've, uh, but during that period of time, he was waiting for her so they could go to Pensacola Christian College together. Now they are required to have a background check from Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea did not start doing criminal background checks until one year ago, which makes it rather difficult to do a background check for when Daniel was 18 to age 19. He has all kinds of other high security clearances with the government for the type of work that he does, but not that one paper. Through a very long series of events, including an ambassador from the United States going and speaking to the person in Papua New Guinea who would issue the paper to the missionary liaison for all the missionaries in Papua New Guinea who has been there for years and speaks all the languages to many contacts and finally an email from that particular person telling my daughter they've told them oh, it would take a long time it would take a long time we simply can't get it done can't get it done they finally sent her an email that says, we need $600 worth of new office equipment, and we think if we got that new office equipment, we could probably produce your paper in less than 30 minutes. In other words, third world corruption. And they can't pay the bribe because, of course, uh, there are federal laws in effect that would disqualify them then from becoming adoptive parents if they were to pay that bribe. So they're between a rock and a hard place. The two boys they're trying to adopt, those of you who have been in prayer meeting know their names, Kolya and Vova, from Ukraine. Kolya just turned 17. Now, Daniel and Sas had both Kolya and Vova all summer long here in the United States, hosting them, basically keeping them out of the war that had been going on over in Ukraine. But they had to send them back because they couldn't get this paper, one piece of paper that says Daniel has no criminal record from age 18 to 19. So I would appreciate seriously your prayers that that would come through because Daniel, or rather Kolya, has been sent back. He can no longer go to the orphanage. Once you pass 16, you cannot go back to the orphanage. Instead, he's been sent to a trade school. When he turns 18, he'll no longer be adoptable by Ukrainian law. He had wanted to go to a trade school where he could learn to fix tractors and drive tractors. But the government assigned you to your trade school. They assigned him to a seamstress school where they do fashion designs of clothing and learn how to sew. In that school, there are 500 girls and 40 boys. And they are pagan girls who have no moral standards. Pray for his moral purity and for his protection. Daniel and Anastasia have managed to arrange with a missionary family who lives five minutes from the trade school for housing Kolya so he doesn't have to live at the trade school. And it's good Bible-believing missionaries, so pray for them too. But they're taking care of Kolya right now. His little brother Vova is back at the orphanage because he's only seven. But I would appreciate your prayers for them. And I brought a picture of them today. This was taken just a couple of weeks ago, I actually got to see both Kolya and Vova before they were shipped back to Ukraine on one of my three trips to Alabama trying to get my wife's gravestone installed. And praise the Lord, on this final trip, we finally got it installed. Um, but uh, I got a picture of them, the entire family, 
with Daniel and Anastasia, and her oldest natural son, Dietrich, and Eric, and then Patrick, and then her two little Chinese boys, Xiaohui and Zhen Ho, and Kolya and Vova. And it's here. So if you'd like to see it after the service today, please come up and hope you will pray for them, because only God can either remove that official or else change his heart uh, to provide that one paper that is necessary for the adoption to proceed. Another boy who is a close friend of Kolya's was adopted by a family in Alabama. In fact, Anastasia, while Kolya was here, drove him down to meet that friend, whose name is Ehud. It's spelled Igor, I-G-O-R, but they pronounce it in Ukraine, Ehud. Um, and uh, he and his sister were adopted by a family in Alabama, a Bible-believing Presbyterian family, believe it or not. And uh, so it was a joy. But they're complete, they're complete with their adoption because they didn't have the same problem that Daniel and Stas have had. So we would much appreciate your prayers, and please come up and take a look at the picture afterwards and then be in prayer for them, if you will. Now please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that we studied just a, or read just a few moments ago. We're in Exodus chapter 10, verses 21 through 29. We're studying the plague of darkness, and what we've studied so far are the plagues of blood, frogs, lice, flies, murrain, which is cattle plague, boils, hails, locusts, darkness, and coming your way soon, death. And we gave you a budak for that. Blood and frogs is blow fro. Lice and flies is lie fly. Murrain and boils is moo bo. Hail and locusts is halo. And then um, death and darkness, or darkness and death is daddy. Blow fro, lie fly, moo bo, halo, daddy. I hope that you can remember that. It'll help you keep all 10 plagues in mind, in order. Now you recall that as we've been comparing these last three plagues, over the last two weeks, this is our third week on this, Ken Olson was here last week of course, we've compared it to hospice care. The removal of all life-sustaining nourishment, that was a plague of locusts. The shutting down of the organs, that's the darkening of the eyes, the mind, the body, and irreversible coma, that's the plague of darkness. And then final termination, that's the plague of death. We're looking at the third in the series on the plague of darkness. And what we've learned so far about the plague of darkness is that it was a supernatural, tangible darkness that showed the supernatural presence of the Shekinah glory. Most people don't put that together, but as you begin to track all the places in the Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament, where the plagues are mentioned, and they're even mentioned in Stephen's sermon in Acts chapter 7, you discover that what we're looking at with the plague of darkness because it was so dark they couldn't move for three days. Did you notice it said that twice in the text as I read it this morning? But it was light in the land of the Jews, in the land of Goshen. Darkness for the unbelievers, light for the believers. That's what the Shekinah glory does. It brings darkness for the unbelievers. It brings light for the believers. We notice that we saw that darkness is often associated with the Shekinah when God is about to judge. And there were many places in the scripture that we read you from that. We saw that the believer who is in fellowship with God does not need to fear what is in the darkness. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by night, for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. We know that in that psalm, which is Psalm 91, that David is actually remembering the Exodus. We all are familiar with Psalm 90 and Psalm 91. Psalm 90, a prayer of Moses, the man of God. We're all familiar with that. Psalm 91, we love that psalm. But you know, David is remembering the Exodus in Psalm 91. We can see that in verse 10. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. So as you read through Psalm 91, remember the ten plagues in Egypt. We're constantly being reminded of those plagues all the way through the Old Testament and multiple times in the New Testament as well. We saw that the darkness contains fearful things and we gave you the illustration of camping out in the forest and camping out in the jungles. Psalm 104 speaks of that. Thou makest darkness and it is night wherein all the beasts of the forest do creep forth. Unbelievers love darkness and because they love darkness God is going to give them darkness for eternity. Jesus says this in John chapter 3. You're all familiar with verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And we get down a little bit further here and it says in verse 19, and this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world. And by the way, light 
and darkness are one of the key motifs, one of the key themes of the Gospel of John. Track light and darkness through the Gospel of John. Incredible amount of spiritual truth that is taught with those two motifs as you go through the Gospel of John. But we get to verse 19. This is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light lest his deeds should be reproved. Light and darkness. You see, as you go through that, you discover believers love darkness. God says, you like darkness? I'll give you darkness. I'll give you darkness for all of eternity because you rejected the light. That's what Jesus says here in John chapter 3. Deliverance from darkness is one of the primary illustrations of salvation in the Bible. Such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and break their bands in sunder. Under the upright there ariseth light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. Out of Isaiah, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Deliverance from darkness is a picture throughout scripture of salvation. And in that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book. The eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. A prophecy about Jesus. Isaiah 42, 7, to open the blind eyes and bring the prisoners from the prison. And them that sit in the darkness of the prison house. Deliverance from the chains of sin. Isaiah 42, 16, and I will bring the blind by the way that they knew not. And I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them and not forsake them. And Jesus makes reference to these passages that I've just quoted out of Isaiah and Psalms in John chapter 8. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. John chapter 12, four chapters later, then Jesus said unto them, yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. Down to verse 36, I am come a light into the world, excuse me, verse 46, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. This is a big theme in the Bible, folks, and it goes back to the plague of darkness in the book of Exodus. You see the connections as you move from Exodus and then you begin to find it referenced again in Deuteronomy and then you find it referenced again in the book of Joshua and you find it referenced again throughout the Old Testament prophets as they take you back to the plague of darkness. And then you find Jesus saying, I'm the light that gets you out of the darkness. The darkness is what the devil's people love and as a result they're going to get it for all of eternity. The light is what God's people love and as a result they'll not sit in darkness, they'll not walk in darkness, they'll not be chained in darkness. They won't stumble in the darkness. They'll have the light of life. And Jesus is the light of life. I think it's also evident that what we've just read, that darkness in the Bible is a picture of spiritual blindness. He talked about those who are blind being able to see. The eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. It's a picture of spiritual blindness. It's a picture of filthy sin. It's a picture of spiritual death. And it takes us back as most everything does in the Bible, it takes us back to the moment of creation. Did you ever stop and think about it? Before God gave light and life, there was just darkness. Genesis 1, 2, the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. We start in darkness, and then God gives light. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Same motif that you find in the Gospel of John, the Gospel of Salvation. It's taking you back to creation. It's taking you back to the plague of darkness, where darkness is picture of lifelessness and of sin and of judgment, and nothing is there. Last week, we, uh, we warned the young people and older people, too. The way of the wicked, this is Proverbs 419, the way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. Whoso curseth his father or his mother, his lamp shall be put out in obscure darkness. We warned all of us 
Don't curse your parents even in your heart because God knows the thoughts of your heart. Because if you do, you know what it says? <clears throat> it says, his lamp shall be put out in obscure darkness. Rather serious warning, especially for young people. Never, never, never curse your parents. The removal of darkness by the Shekinah glory is one of the great messianic prophecies in Isaiah chapter 60. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee and his glory shall be seen upon thee. His glory is the Shekinah. Our Lord Jesus Christ fulfilled that. You recognize those words from Handel's Messiah. <clears throat> That's one of the great prophecies that Handel set to music in that great oratorio, the Messiah. The rejection of the light of Christ will plunge you into darkness. You can have some light and you know the light can get turned out. Listen to what Jesus said, Luke chapter 11, verses 34 and 35. The light of the body is the eye. Therefore, when thine eye is single, thy whole body also is full of light. But when thine eye is evil, thy body also is full of darkness. Take heed, therefore, that the light which is in thee be not darkness. Darkness is a picture of the vanity of life without God. That, by the way, is the theme of the book of Ecclesiastes. The whole book of Ecclesiastes tells you that life without God is vanity. It doesn't matter how much money you've got, what good health and strength you've got, how many awards you've won, what position you've got in your company. It doesn't matter what kind of boats and houses and cars and airplanes and all the stuff, the vain junk of earth that you've accumulated. Without God, it's empty. Absolutely empty. And when you have God, you realize it's not yours. It's only a stewardship he has entrusted to you. And you will be held accountable for everything that he gives to you. Because you don't own it. You're a steward of it. And the master requires stewards to be found faithful. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. It is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Ecclesiastes 2.14. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in darkness. And I myself perceive that one event happeneth to them all. What do you think the one event is that happens to everybody? Death. Fool walks in darkness. He doesn't know it's coming. What is the ninth plague? Darkness. What is the tenth plague? Death. Those are the two things that are mentioned here in Ecclesiastes 2.14. The fool walks in darkness. I myself perceive that one event happens to them all. Darkness precedes death, just like the ten plagues. Ecclesiastes 5.17, All his days also eateth in darkness. He hath much sorrow and wrath with his sickness. For he cometh in vanity and departeth in darkness, and his name shall be covered with darkness. People want to leave a legacy. They want people to remember them. On Memorial Day a couple of years ago, we talked about that. How much people want others to remember them. With lots and lots of money, they leave things that will have their name on them, but don't bring glory to God. You're going to have a tombstone someday. I just installed Judy's tombstone. It's got my name on it, too. But it doesn't just have our names on it. Most tombstones, when you walk through the cemetery, have the name of the person, date of birth, date of death. So anybody walking through the cemetery will say, a dead guy's buried here. And they probably won't stop and read it. Did you know that 150 years ago that was not the case here in the United States? You look at some of the tombstones that date back over 100 years and you will find Bible verses on them. Believers who wanted to leave a testimony not to themselves but a testimony to Jesus Christ. You all know that it has taken me nine months, ten months, to get that stone finally installed because it has many, many Bible verses on it. The whole front of the stone is covered with Bible verses. The back of the stone's got Bible verses on it. It's 12 feet wide, 4 feet tall. And it's covered with scripture. And Judy's parents' gravestone, which is to the left of where Judy is buried, has Bible verses. I bought all five of those graves. And I had inscribed on her dad's tombstone, Romans 10, 9 and 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. On Judy's mother's tombstone, she's not dead yet, but it's already inscribed. 
Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, as the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. On Judy's tombstone, major portion of Proverbs 31, who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband does safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. And then down to the end, she opens her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she should be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. The tombstone is the gates between life and death. Her works praise her in the gates because her work was her children, all 13 of them. And so on the back side of her stone, all 13 children's names are mentioned. They're listed in order. After Psalm 113, verse 9, the last phrase, A joyful mother of children, praise ye the Lord. And then the line, Homeschooled, birth through 12th grade, R.L. Uziah, M.D. Or Netanya Yehudit, M.D., Ph.D., R.L. Uziah, M.D., Philemon Theologos, M.D., Nehemiah Ebenezer, M.D., and so on down the list. That was her work. And those are children who love Jesus Christ and are serving him. On the back of my stone, much of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the great resurrection chapter. On the front of the stone, verses dealing with wisdom and dealing with the return of Christ, the blessed hope, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. When people walk through that cemetery, I hope they pause and read the stone. Dear people, what are you doing to bring glory to Christ not only in life but in death? When you write your will, and I've gotten off my topic, I know, but God just placed this on my heart at the moment. Do you have a Christian last will and testament or do you have a pagan last will and testament? A pagan last will and testament focuses on material things, on leaving junk to people. A Christian last will and testament focuses on eternal things, teaching by the way in which you leave things, biblical truth. And it should have a doctrinal statement of what you believed at the very first part of it. I've written many last wills and testaments as an attorney. I only write Christian last wills and testaments. And they always begin, by the grace of God, amen. I so-and-so being of sound mind and uh, sound body and sound mind, you know, leave the following things. First and foremost, I want to leave my testament of faith to my children and grandchildren. I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. He died for my sins, was buried, rose again, and so on. Mine is about three pages long. I can't quote it to you. <laughs> the doctrinal portion of my will, because I don't have that much junk to leave. But I do have faith in Jesus Christ. And that's the thing I want my children most of all to know. When that gets filed at the courthouse, the probate judge will have to read it. When that gets filed at the courthouse, the clerks of the probate judge will have to read it. When that gets filed at the courthouse, people doing genealogical research will have to read it. How many generations are left here on earth? We don't know. But for as long as that courthouse stands, that will be a permanent record of faith in Jesus Christ. I hope you're doing things like that, people. Think in, things of term, in terms of things eternal, not in terms of things that are temporal. Darkness comes and then death, and every one of us here is facing it. And I faced it once again as I stood there and watched them install that stone, spent some time with my children who were there, then spent some time alone, thanking God for the woman that God gave me. A woman who gave her life to Christ when she was just a girl and lived zealously for him. Okay, I can't start talking about Judy. We'll never get through with the sermon. Back to the plague of darkness. Darkness is a picture of judgment during the day of the Lord. We saw that in Joel chapter 2, Amos chapter 5, and Zephaniah chapter 1, and Acts chapter 2. 
In other words, that's something that's very, very much a part of both Old Testament and New Testament. The darkness in our text could be felt like you can feel water when you're submerged. It says in verse 21 of Exodus 10, even darkness which may be felt. Remember when we talked about Abraham three weeks ago, that Abraham was partnered to a covenant that God cut with Abraham. God was the principal party in that covenant that God made with Abraham. And Abraham felt the horror of darkness. It says so in Genesis chapter 15. It's in Genesis 15 that Abraham believes the word of the Lord and it was counted to him for righteousness. And that's quoted in Romans chapter 4 verse 13. For the promise that he should be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. And then he quotes that passage out of Genesis chapter 15. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. It was at the cutting of the Abrahamic covenant that God revealed the Egyptian bondage to Abraham. The very thing that is taking place in our text. God told Abraham at that time that the Egyptian bondage was coming. And Abraham felt the horror of darkness, the same darkness that was felt by Pharaoh. Verse 12 of Genesis 15, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. God prophesied exactly what's taking place in our text 400 years before it happened. He told Abraham, that's what's going to happen to your descendants. I gave an illustration a couple of weeks ago about total darkness in Carlsbad Caverns, but Carlsbad is 55 degrees. The darkness that's described in Scripture is going to be extremely hot. It's called a hot, smoking darkness. For example, here's the darkness that characterizes hell. It also is in the Shekinah. 2 Peter 2.4 For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Now, you know, we don't talk about it enough, and certainly it's not talked about in almost any of your new evangelical churches today, but I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about hell. When was the last time you heard a sermon on hell? I mention it every now and then, but you know, you go and visit when you're on vacation, and I hope you visit churches when you're on vacation. Don't just say, hey, it's a good day to take off. God doesn't take it off for you. He wants you there. He wants to meet in fellowship with you. He wants you to meet with other believers. Forsaking not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Christ is coming back. It's getting closer. Are you ready for it? You need to be in church on Sunday. And I know I'm preaching to the choir at this point. But for those who are not here, who may hear this later, you should be in church every time the doors are open, if you love God's people and if you love him. So let's talk about hell. It's a real place. It's a real place of darkness. It's a real place of fire. It's a real place of torment. And it lasts forever. It's a place you don't want to be. And this life is the only opportunity you will get to avoid it. With the plague of darkness, God was warning Pharaoh of what was about to happen to him. Pharaoh was about to go into eternal darkness. There's some important things to remember about hell. Number one, people got it all wrong. We're coming up to what the world calls Halloween. And there are going to be a lot of children out there running around in demonic costumes. No Christian should ever let their kids run around in demonic costumes or give threats of trick or treat. That is, if you don't give me something, I'm going to do something bad to your house. I can remember back when I was a kid, the kinds of things they did. They'd fill a bag full of manure and set it on the front porch and light it. They would throw eggs at people's houses. Now, they may still do those kinds of things today, except I think they're even worse. They're, you hear stories of people putting pins and needles inside of candy that they give to kids and all kinds of horrible things. Listen. No Christian has any right to participate in Halloween. That is the devil's holiday. It always has been, and it still is, and always will be. God gave us the Reformation on October 31st, breaking the chains of darkness. Martin Luther nailed his theses to the door at the church at Wittenberg. 
And that began the flame that started the fires of the Reformation, which broke us from the chains of Rome. You don't celebrate Halloween, not if you're a believer. It's wickedness. But just remember this, the devil is not the king of hell. The devil is not the king of hell. That's the place where the devil is going to be punished. Revelation 20, verse 10 and 14. The devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. The devil is going to be tormented in hell. It's not he's down there all jolly poking people with a pitchfork right now. That is the place of his judgment and his punishment. Revelation 20:14. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Number two. Hell is where all unbelievers will spell, spend eternity. Revelation 20, 15. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Your name's not in the book of life. You're on your way to hell right now. Revelation 21, 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the whoremongers and the sorcerers and the idolaters and all liars. Are you a liar? Look at the category it's stuck with. Whoever loves and makes a lie. And all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That's the same place the devil's going to get thrown. That's the same place that the beast and the false prophet are going to get thrown. And it burns forever. Hell is where all unbelievers will spend eternity. Hell is where the rebellious fallen angels, the demons, will spend eternity. Jude 1, 6. And the angels which kept not their first estate but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness. Ooh, hell's not only hot, but hell is dark. Under the judgment of the great day. Jude one thirteen, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. That's the apostates. That's where all the apostates are going to spend eternity. Hell is where all the people who take the mark of the beast will spend eternity. Revelation 14.10 The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture under the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Now, wait a minute. That's all the people who receive the mark of the beast, and suddenly we're having the presence of the holy angels mentioned, and we're having the presence of the Lamb mentioned. There are multiple terms for angels in the Bible. There are the cherubim. Those are the covering ones. Those are the ones that shadow the Ark of the Covenant. Lucifer, son of the morning, prior to his fall, was a cherubim in the very presence of God. But there are also angels that are called seraphim. The I am ending is a plural in Hebrew. That means the burning ones. The burning ones. Angels that are like a flame of fire, according to the book of Hebrews. It maketh his ministering spirits a flame of fire. Here it says that these people who receive the mark of the beast are going to be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Remember what we learned about the Shekinah glory? The Shekinah glory is a fire that burns but does not consume. Remember the burning bush, Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 and 14? It burns but it does not consume. It also has those interesting characteristics. It's darkness for one group of people. It's light for another group of people. It separates between the two people. Just like between Israel and Egypt, where one could not come near another all night long. Where it's separated between... Israel and the Egyptians as they're crossing the sea so the Egyptians couldn't get through to the Israelites because of the darkness that was between them. It says the Shekinah glory came from in front of Israel and it stood between them and the Egyptians who are desperately trying to follow them into the sea. It's darkness for the one, it's light for the other. It's blessing for one and when they get halfway across God looks out of the cloud of the Shekinah and knocks off all the wheels of the 600 chariots, 1,200 wheels on the bottom of the ocean someplace. Knock them all off. So it says they drave heavily and they said, the Lord is fighting for Israel. We've got to turn around and get out of here. And as they turned to go back, 
God closed the walls of water. And they were little tiny puddles. The word for walls that is used there, and we'll get to that eventually when we get in the book of Exodus farther, but those walls, it's a word for great city walls. They weren't wading through the mud where their chariots got stuck. Think of a huge city wall and you're standing next to it and that wall collapses on you. There's no way they could get out. Shekinah glory did that. It says the Lord, and I believe that's the Lord Jesus Christ, because all judgment is committed under the sun, John chapter 8. The Lord Jesus Christ is the one who judged the Egyptians. The Lord Jesus Christ is the righteous judge in the book of Revelation. There is so much in Scripture, people, that ties together that if we would simply take time and look at it, what about Elsa about hell? Hell is where the beast and the false prophet will spend eternity. Revelation 19:20. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet. The beast is the Antichrist. And with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. Now some of you have seen photography of volcanoes erupting. I know some of you here have seen it because I showed you some videos of Mount St. Helens, which is uh, when it exploded uh, and carved a, a, a canyon, which is 1 40th the size of the Grand Canyon in one afternoon. The evolutionists will tell you that the Grand Canyon took, you know, millions of years to carve by a little water running through the rocks and finally cutting all the way down to the bottom. And I was there at the Grand Canyon once and I heard the, the guide who was a thoroughgoing evolutionist. It was back when I was much younger, back in my high school days. And uh, he was explaining that, yes, this little bit of water, tiny little stream cut through this rock over these millions of years. And you also got to take into account that there were a lot of little animals that were kicking out little chipmunks dug the Grand Canyon. Come on, give me a break. They believe that. No. When Mount St. Helens erupted, it cut one a 40th of the size of the Grand Canyon in one afternoon. A lot of water in a little bit of time, mud flows, ripping up entire forests, turning them upside down in spirit lakes so that you have the same kind of things that you have in the Grand Canyon where you have this anomaly of a petrified tree trunk running through multiple layers. How could that have happened? The tree couldn't have grown for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, millions of years, as those layers were being laid down. Dear people, we serve a living God. Think of being in a lava flow. That's like the lake of fire. That's the way the scripture describes it. But it's going to be a fire that burns and does not consume, which means it's going to be for eternity. You will not be consumed. You will not be burned up. You will not be annihilated. If you are not a believer, you will spend eternity in utter darkness, darkness that can be felt. You will spend eternity in the smoke and cloud of this darkness. You will spend eternity in the painful fires of hell. That's what the Bible says. You don't have to believe it, but you'd better because God said so. And if you don't believe it, you're calling God a liar. You're calling Jesus a liar. Jesus is the one who is speaking in the book of Revelation. You know that, don't you? You read the first two verses of the book of Revelation. John is just the amanuensis. John is just the scribe who is writing what, down what Jesus is telling him. Jesus said that. That's where the beast and the false prophet will spend eternity. Remember, hell is totally dark. Hell is screaming hot. Now, how do you know if you're on your way there? Well, Jesus said if you have no spiritual fruit in your life, it's proof that you're lost and that you're headed for hell. If you have no spiritual fruit in your life, you're not saved by your works, but you, if you're saved, your life will produce spiritual fruit. Listen to what Jesus said. In fact, he says it in Matthew 3, says it in Matthew 5, says it in Matthew 7, says it in Matthew 13, but multiple times in uh, Matthew 18, says it multiple times in the Gospel of Mark, says it in Luke, uh, he says it in John. Let me just read you a few of them. Matthew 3.10. Now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees, therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down, and what are the last four ver words? Cast into the fire. No fruit, it's the fire. Verse 12, whose fan is in his hand, he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. It's a fire that burns but does not consume. 
Matthew 5, 22, But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Whosoever shall say unto his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Matthew 7, 19, Every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Jesus talked more about hell than he talked about heaven. Because he doesn't want you to go there. Matthew 13, verses 40 and 42. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be at the end of this world. And shall cast them into a furnace of fire, and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Verse 50. And shall cast them into a furnace of fire, and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 18, 8. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off, cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed, rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. Do you get it? I mean, none of us wants to cut off a hand or a foot. Jesus said, let me give it to you in terms you'll understand. It would be better for you to be amputated and go to heaven than to not be amputated and go to hell. We're all worried about this life. We're all worried about this body. We're all worried about the stuff of earth. Jesus says, think eternity. This is short here. Where are you going to be for eternity? Matthew 25, 41. Then shall he also say to them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. And here he tells us why hell was originated. It wasn't originally for us. It was prepared for the devil and his angels. That's where they're going to be judged. And you know what? You love darkness? You love the devil. You love darkness? You'll be with your master. He's darkness. The prince of darkness. That's where you're going if you don't trust Christ. And you won't have any excuses. You heard this sermon today. Are you ready? Are you ready? He says the same things in the Gospel of Mark. He adds a few more there. Where their worm dieth not, their fire is not quenched. He says that four or five times as he goes through Mark chapter 9. Uh, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Verse 46. Verse 48, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Luke chapter 3, verse 9, now also the axe is laid to the tree. Every tree, therefore, which breathes not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Get down to chapter 17. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them. That is given as an illustration of hell in the New Testament, Sodom and Gomorrah. It's a visible reminder of what hell will be like. And it's a visible reminder of what happens to those who pervert what God has ordained for marriage. John 15, 6. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. The appearance of the Shekinah at the burning bush was key in Stephen's sermon in Acts chapter 7. Verse 30, And when forty years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in the flame of fire in a bush. He's tracking the history of Israel to show them how they have rejected the revelation that God gave to them. And God began to give it to Moses when Moses stood before the burning bush and God said unto him, Take off the shoes from thine feet, for the ground whereon thou standest is holy ground. And God called him and sent him to Egypt, which is where we are in our text today. And Stephen makes reference of that in Acts chapter 7. The Shekinah glory is seen in judgment in the doctrinal epistles of the New Testament. 2 Thessalonians 1.8 In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Interesting, he didn't just say that believe not, he said that obey not. You see, genuine faith produces works. What you really believe will change your life. If it doesn't change your life, you don't believe it. You can talk it all you want, but you say that you believe it, you don't do it, you're a hypocrite. Do you really believe? You know my question. I've said it to you many, many times. Someone says to me, I'm a Christian. I say, oh really, you say you're a Christian? So how has it changed your life? Because if you're a Christian, if you've truly trusted Christ, it changes your life. You didn't start off perfect. There are things that will drop out of your life after you trust in Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit begins to work on you. There are things that will be added to your life that were not in your life before. 
when the Holy Spirit begins to work on you, when you truly believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and are saved, it will change your life. All the stubbornness, all the resistance, all the recalcitrance, all the I will not do this or I will do that, I don't care what God says about it, those things begin to change. And you know how I know they will change? Because the book of Hebrews says so. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you be without chastisement, where of all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. In other words, God spanks his children when they will not obey him. And he spanks them hard until he gets rid of the bad stuff and instills the good stuff. So if you never get chastened by God, you better examine your heart to see whether or not you are in the faith. Examine your heart to see whether or not you are reprobate. Examine your heart to see whether or not you really are saved. Because salvation changes your life. And hell is the result if it doesn't. Oh, people, you can pretend hell isn't there, but the Bible says it is. Hebrews 12, 29, for our God is a consuming fire. Well, our time is up for today. I'm sorry, we still have, I'm on page 8 of 14. We're going to have to continue uh, next week, the Lord willing. Actually, not next week. Next week is Mission Sunday. Uh, and so we have missionaries speaking next week, but we will continue this, the Lord willing, uh, when we get to October. Let's join together in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. Father, it's so sad that no one has the fear of God before their eyes anymore. It seems so rare, so hard to find, because they don't realize that our God is a consuming fire. They don't realize that there is a God of judgment, that our Lord Jesus Christ said all judgment is committed under the sun. That someday those who have rejected him will have to face him. And he will be their judge. Right now he offers himself as the gracious savior. The one who delivers us from the power of sin, the power of Satan, the power of the flesh, the power of the world, who delivers us from hell, who delivers us from darkness, that we might walk in the light as he is in the light and have fellowship one with another as the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Father, cause us a people, a people who walk not in darkness, but who walk in light, who have joy in the light, who love the light, who do not love the darkness, who come to the light, Father, fill our hearts with light. Let not the light that is in us be darkness, for how great is that darkness. Father, we pray that you'll take your word, that you use it in each of our hearts, that you use it in a powerful way to transform us into the image of Christ. Father, help us to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, that we might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God that we wouldn't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Father, we pray for your blessings on your word as it has gone forth this day to the glory of Jesus Christ, your Son. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is hymn number 613. 613, all your anxieties lay on him. Mm -hmm.